you should be uh, seeing the itinerary for the seminar. Uh, we'll first have the professional development session with Dr. Kate in a moment, and she's going to uh, share her expertise um, in uh, the creativity in the classroom, approaches to reading, writing, and English. Then our program management team will be giving you an overview of the Chatteris English program and how you can join us in the next school year. Uh, and before the end of today, we have two of our partner schools sharing the experiences they have so far with Chatteris program and how they deploy the Chatteris English tutors at their school. And then we'll finish it off with a Q&A session at the end. But before we jump into professional development session, I'd like to invite SK our, um, to give the opening speech. SK is our vice chairman of Chatteris Board. He is also ex-principal assistant of the sec Secretary of Professional Development Training at EDB and also academic advisor at HKUGA College, honorary advisor faculty education at University of Hong Kong. A very long title. So I'd like to uh, pass the ground to SK. Okay. Um, let me test whether you can hear me first <laughs> because I've just set up the, the uh, equipment. Okay, thank you, Margaret. And uh, many thanks to the um, principals and teachers who are joining the seminar. Uh, this is a very um, important moment for the Tetris to introduce ourselves every year and to attract uh, newcomers that we, we enjoy to work with. So, um, First of all, I would like to uh, thank um, thank uh, our professional development speaker, Dr. Kat, Kat Erica uh, from No Angular uh, International School on her in upcoming talk. The talk is about stimulating creativity in the classroom and uh, innovative approaches to reading and writing in English. And uh, the title is closely related to the service that Tetris is providing for uh, teaching and learning in schools. So thank you very much, Dr. K. Uh, Erica. And um, a bit more about uh, Tetris. Um, as you know that Tetris uh, was established in 1990s. Uh, we have a long history, more than 30 years already. Um, since then, uh, we have placed already 2,000, uh, nearly 2,000 English tutors in uh, hundreds of schools across Hong Kong. And uh, the beneficiary would be the students, of course. We try to raise the English proficiency and self-confidence of our um, young people. We all recognize that um, the service we are providing is more, more um, clear towards uh, enjoyable learning and also activities. And in particular, uh, after the three years of the COVID-19 pandemic, we also explore new approaches to help our schools to narrow the learning gaps in English learning. And uh, we try to uh, explore many ways through uh, e-learning, through face-to-face -face contact, and also small groups learning, things like that. So um, perhaps uh, later on, you will know more about what we are doing in these new areas. So um, we have to thank um, our Chatteris staff uh, at this moment because they have spent uh, many, a lot of time in preparing the seminar and also our partner schools who are joining us to share their experience. So um, I, I don't want to uh, waste your time here and uh, so that uh, I will move on uh, to, to be an audience first and then uh, maybe uh, half an hour later, I believe the the uh, seminar because I have another engagement. So I hope you will enjoy the the seminar, enjoy the talk, and uh, in the afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you, SK. So, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, let's move quickly into the professional development session, Dr. K. Did I see on my screen, Margaret? Ah, uh, yes, I will stop yeah. sharing and you can share your screen. Okay. There you go. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Thumbs up. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so hi, I'm Kate. I am the Assistant Director Curriculum for Nord Anglia Education. We are an international schools group with campuses all over the world. I think we have 87 schools around the globe and we have three campuses here in Hong Kong. 
Now, I'm privileged to be able to speak with you today. And the reason I'm able to do so is because of our collaboration with Chatteris. We've been working together with Chatteris for the past few years to provide professional development sessions for teachers in Hong Kong. And our aim is that teachers from all sectors have opportunities to collaborate and share educational ideas and great practice. Now, before I worked for North Anglia as an assistant director, I was a secondary English teacher in state schools in the UK and then an English advisor for a local authority. And my first passion was teaching, reading and writing. And so this is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Innovative approaches to reading and writing in English that stimulate creativity in the classroom. But I'm gonna start by asking you a question. So I want to ask you how creative do you think you are? And I'm gonna give you four options. Not very, a little, quite or very creative. And I'd like a range of answers here. Some people are a little creative, some people not very creative. Then we have a one or two people. No, nobody has said they are very creative yet. And this is really interesting. And the reason I ask is Sir Ken Robinson, who's an educationalist, gives a great talk on creativity. It's worth listening to it if you haven't seen it before. I can send around a link afterwards. He's fascinating. What he says is that he did a report on creativity, education, and the economy. And it shows that young people lose their ability to think in divergent or nonlinear ways, a key component of creativity as they get older. So of the 1,600 students they asked, aged three to five, 98% said they were creative. They could think in divergent ways. By the time they were eight to 10 years old, only 32% could. When they did the same test with 13 to 15 year olds, it was 10%. And when they got to 25, only 2% of people said they were creative. And Ken Robinson's point was that schooling educates us out of creativity. It makes us better able to think in a focused way, but maybe less able to think in a creative and a divergent way. We can find the right answers, but not necessarily the answers that help us best express ourselves. Now his daughter, because he's not with us anymore, but his daughter is Kate Robinson, and she's written a book of his thinking. And it says that creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. So creativity is not an outcome, it's a way of doing something. And original ideas means original to you. Someone else might have thought of them out there in the world, but they're new ideas for yourself. And they have value. Now, value is interesting. And we assume here that they have value to the person who's expressing them. And they might have value to others as well. But what's most important is that that idea has value to the person who's expressing it for themselves. A lot of discussion has been had recently about the kind of creativity that we need in the world, especially as AI tools that can write and produce images have emerged. We've been talking about what's the role of our intelligence, our creativity, in a world in which machines can seemingly do the same. And the division potentially looks like this, though obviously it's still something that's up for discussion. We look on the left of this slide, we have artificial intelligence and AI gives us a replica of cognition. It gives us the what and the how in that it can create, but only with all information that it already has. So it seems original, but it's actually repackaged depending on the information that it has available. And it's interesting when we think then about AI authored text or art, it may be beautiful, but is it as meaningful if it's not produced by another person? If we think about human intelligence, it focuses on the why. 
It's the metacognition, the reasons and the meaning behind something. And this is interesting because it makes us ask questions about value. You know, what value does this have to me and others? What do I think of it? And what use will this be to me in the future? Essentially, AI has forced us to start answering a question that students have been asking for a really long time, which is what is the point of school? And what is the point of what I'm doing at school at the moment? And this is exactly what these students need to work out, our students need to work out, because education and creating response will only be meaningful if students can work out why it's meaningful for them, why it's valuable, how they're gonna use it, and what they're gonna do with it in the future. And this is a beautiful quote. Um, it's a recent publication and it finishes with this sentence. The publication is called The Changes We Need, Education Post COVID-19. And it finishes with the statement that for humans to thrive in the age of smart machines, it's essential that we don't compete with machines. Instead, they need to become more human. And it's in the humanness of education the way that we think about how we make the most of our most human qualities, that education is going to thrive in the future. And for this, we need English. So this is important when we think about our role as English teachers, because there are few things that are better to prompt human qualities, to prompt a human creative response, than the study and creation of literature. Reading and writing generate empathy and a really deep connection to the human experience. Reading and writing are about finding shared experiences with others, regardless of who wrote it, of shared feelings, of words creating a feeling in somebody else, and shared responses, and then us generating those feelings and responses in other people. And you can see, I didn't know this, but there's actually an empathy day. It's sometime in June, I think the date changes a little bit. And the people who created the, the empathy day, there's a link at the bottom, it says the empathy that we feel for book characters wires our brains to have the same sensitivity towards real people. And Chris Riddle has displayed this as a, um, a cartoon on the right where he says that reading allows us to see and understand the world through the eyes of others. A good book is an empathy engine. And it's true. It's through studying literature, it's through being involved in books and the experiences of others that we're better able to feel alongside others. And it's a crazy statistic. This is a statistic from Neil Gaiman. The, when they look at the, um, the population of prisons in New York, their metric for being able to calculate what the population of prisons will be in the future is how many of young people are able to read for pleasure at the age of 11. Because it's their best metric of working out how people their experiences can resonate alongside other people's, whether they can reach in and be part of that shared response. Now, as part of this seminar, I really wanted to share some books that I think are amazing. So I'm gonna start by sharing a book that um, can, is good for empathy. So this is a great example of how you can take a book that you use with your class, and this could be with really young students, and generate empathy and personal response with them. Because a creative, re a creative response that, you know, original idea that has value starts with a personal response to literature. Students need to respond themselves before they can start writing creatively themselves. So this is a great example of a text that a student could have a personal response to. This is the book Red by Michael Hall. And it's the story of a crayon. And Red is a red crayon, but he's blue. And despite trying really, really hard, he cannot live up to his name. The other crayons 
and the pencils telling the story all have opinions as to why he's failing as a red crayon until one day, and you can see this, he's drawing the strawberries and he's not doing well. Until one day, a new friend asked him to draw an ocean for her boat. And it turns out he's amazing at it. And the new perspective allows the other crayons to accept who he is, that his label was wrong, and they can see him differently and accept him how he is inside. And it's a simple story, but it's a good story about difference and acceptance. And it's easy to understand for the youngest of audiences. And this is the process we go through when we read books. And whether it's Red, or it's Wonder, or it's the book Holes, or it's Lord of the Flies, this same process is what we go through as readers when we're responding personally to literature, to books. So today I want to talk through a process that focuses on how we can create empowered learners who have confidence in their own creative voice. So in their response to the creative voices of others and in growing a creative voice of their own. Now you can see in the center, the thing that really matters is having a book that you're passionate about. So a high quality text. And by this, I mean something that resonates enough with you and your students for you to care about it and care about the characters in it. Whether it's something like Red or something more difficult or for, for older readers, something that you can really respond to. And it's also a text that can be used as a model that your students would want to write something that feels or sounds a bit like that book. It's going to be an, a spark of inspiration for their own work. So you can see here on the left are readers as writers. So we want to create students who think about the big ideas in our books. Think about what they respond to and can identify the feelings that books generate in us. And think about why it makes them feel that way. This is personal response. And when they're reading, it's really important that that's the part we get them to do. As well as understanding what the word means, understanding their own response to it. Because that's where the creativity bit is going to kick in. And we also want them to be writers who consider their readers. So to think about what they want to say that matters. What ideas they want to express that have value to them. How they want their reader to feel. And how they're going to do this, the words and the phrases and yes, the grammar, those tools that they're going to use to communicate their big ideas to their waiting audience. Now this starts, this whole process of generating creative readers and writers starts with us as English teachers. So I'd like to do another poll and I'd like to ask you, how do you usually read? There are four options on your phone, on an ebook device like a Kindle, with paper copies of books, or if you don't get the opportunity to read for pleasure much, then that's an option too. Margaret, does the poll pop up on screen? Sorry, it's going to be just the chat box, if everyone can type their okay, chat box. the chat there. box is fine, yeah. no problem. So the four options are on a phone, on an ebook device like a Kindle, paper copies of books, or if you don't get the opportunity to read for pleasure much. Okay, so we've got a couple of phones, a couple of ebooks, some Kindles. I'm a Kindle fan. I've got all my books on a Kindle. It saves me a whole ton of space. Okay, the reason I'm asking is because modern modes of readers save us a lot of space. So when you're reading on your phone or you're reading on a Kindle, you're not carrying around a library. 
It saves space in your home, but it also makes the practice of reading invisible. We no longer see people reading books. If you go on the MTR in Hong Kong, you don't see many people reading paper copies of books. Because then they might be reading books, but they'll be reading books on their phone or on a device. If you go on the tube in London, you see loads of people reading books because it has terrible, terrible Wi-Fi and no signal. So everybody reads books all the time because there's nothing else to do. But you would take the wrong um, conclusion from that. You would think, oh, maybe people here aren't, aren't reading. Maybe we just don't have a culture of readers. Be entirely the wrong assumption. We have great Wi-Fi connection in Hong Kong, so people can read on devices, whereas in London, they can't. However, this also translates to how children, students, and young adults see our reading practices. They can't see us read anymore because we're reading in a way that isn't visible to them. So they don't necessarily know our enthusiasm. It's not like a bookshelf where they can browse through and choose. It's all very efficiently on an invisible shelf. So this makes it even more important that as teachers, we demonstrate our enthusiasm for the books that we love, for the creative response of others. PISA, the big global survey, has found there's a correlation between enthusiastic teachers and student achieving in reading. It's not a surprise. When you love a book, your students are much more likely to love that book too. So when we talk about our reading, when we share the books we love and why we love them, students start to love them as a result. If you share the new words you're learning and the new information, then they'll start to be excited by those new words and new information too. So we are our students' reading role models. We need to read children's literature. We need to have favorite books that are at the same level as the books that they're reading and be able to talk to them about them in a way that feels meaningful. If you're teaching young adults, read young adult literature. There's tons of it now and it's amazing. If you're reading picture books that are appropriate for five-year-olds, because that's the age of the students you're working with, then share your enthusiasm for those as well. Tell them why that book is amazing and they'll think it's amazing too. There are lots of very practical ways you can do this as well with things like book corners and bookshelves in your classroom and what I'm reading signs on your door. Um, and all of these are great. Having reading in your environment is really important. But the biggest sell is your enthusiasm for the books that they might want to read too. OK, so I'm going to talk through a process in the second half of this webinar. And this is the creative process for reading and writing that I want to share. It's, it's a process I tried to follow in the classroom. It is the, the process I had most success with when I wanted students to respond creatively as readers and as writers. There are five parts. You start with the text, the text that you love and that you're gonna use as a model. You find the big idea the thing that you're going to get excited about together. You read deeper and respond personally. So they're going to find that value in somebody else's work. They imitate it. This is vital for finding their voice. And then they write their own. Preferably in the style of the one that they've read, because that's going to help them with the scaffold and is really good for students who are newer to English or lack confidence in their creativity. And the older your students, the more likely they are to lack confidence in their creativity. So the text is your class's reading experience, source of inspiration and model for writing. So these are all books I love chosen at, at random ac across age ranges going from about four to about 16. Um, I'm not talking about book banded books here, um, they have a place as students get fluent with reading. And I'm not talking about the books that students read independently, like Wimpy Kid or, or fan fiction. Those are also great. What I'm talking about right now are the books that you are going to share with your class as part of your teaching process. The things you're going to study together to inform your reading and your writing. And if you're worried when you pick a book about ranges of difficulty, um, consider you can consider adapting extracts from books. That works too. 
um, or for different proficiency levels. Uh, there are recommendations on the CLP website, which I share as a link at the end if you're stuck for choice, if you want some recommendations. Um, anything you're excited about can work. It doesn't have to be books. It can also be websites. It, will, it can also be um, nonfiction. But basically, we just need a source of inspiration, something to get us started. So there's a lovely selection here. Um, the one I've actually oddly had the most success with was when I was teaching secondary and I made everybody write in the voice of Raymond Chandler, like um, a detective and we wrote detective stories, but there's also Survivors is a great text. It's nonfiction. If you're doing stories about getting stuck in the wild or um, Leon in the Place Between is about magic. Look Both Ways is a newer favorite. It's recent. And it's about an experience of being a middle schooler and what it's like to be judged as a child when people think you're doing the wrong thing, but actually you might not be. They're short stories. So we've chosen our book. And you've chosen the book you think you can work and the thing you're gonna get excited about together. And they're also gonna write in the style of later, potentially. And now you find the big idea. So this is at least one lesson, it might be more. And it's an opportunity to engage with the big ideas of the text. So background knowledge matters. If a student doesn't know the world that that text is about, they're gonna have a lot more trouble comprehending. Um, Daniel Willingham, who's a neuroscientist, says in his book, Why Students Don't Like School, um, if you've got two students and you've got a book about baseball, the student who knows a lot about baseball but is a low attaining reader will score more highly in their understanding and comprehension than the high attaining student who knows nothing about baseball. If a student knows something about the world that the book is in or the key ideas, everything is gonna come easier to them. So if you've got a book about betrayal, investigate the theme of betrayal, work out, find experiences that resonate, talk to students about the key idea, introduce some new vocabulary, so if we were doing survivors, which is about survival stories, think about a scenario they could respond to. What would you do to survive if you were stuck in an Amazon rainforest? What words would we need to use to communicate about that? What are we going to do? Get them to make a plan. Get them to put themselves in the book before you start reading the book. Also, we'll get them excited about reading it. In Look Both Ways, have a conversation about how young people are judged today. And is this wrong? Do they feel that? Is this a theme that resonates with them personally? And then the book I'm gonna use as an example today is called The Lost Words. Um, so The Lost Words is interesting. The stimulus for this is that the um, there's a, a dictionary, the Oxford Children's Dictionary, and it can only take so many words and they have to choose what to keep in and what to leave out. And what the authors realized is that as new words were added, other words were disappearing. And the new words that were coming in were all technological. They were things like voicemail or iPads or I don't know, all the other words. I think the one this year was Riz that went in. And the words were disappearing were the words for the natural world. Kingfisher, acorn, wren. So our children's vocabulary is becoming more technological and the words that exist for them are not the words of the natural world anymore. And so this book, The Lost Words, was the author's attempt to bring them back. So when we're thinking then, and this is an example of reading deeper and respond number three, how are we going to personally respond to a text? How are we going to get involved and thinking about what the texts are about and which words resonate? So uh, this is a bag of words. It's one of my favorite techniques for getting students engaged in text before they know much about it. It helps me know which words they don't understand and it gets them engaging with ideas super early. So I've got some words on screen. I would like some predictions in the chat, please. What do you think this book is about? Pop some ideas in, or if you can make connections between a couple of words. If you think that thorns and snarled, for example, is about somebody 
I don't know, getting caught on some thorns or like it catching their jumper or something like that. Put that prediction in the chat. But this will start us discussing. We're going to start engaging with the ideas. Just keywords. So any ideas in the chat? I'll give you a couple of moments. Thank you, Ben. Nature and birds, countryside animals. Okay, we've got a Robin Hood thief story coming up here. Nature in springtime. Okay, if you were my class, I would be calling out your names right now and I'd be asking you why. Yeah, I'm not going to because I'm a little short of time, but I would totally love to and ask which words specifically, for example, Haley, maybe you think about nature in springtime or Zach, what was prompting you to think about countryside animals? And we're going to just go deep into the creative choices that the writer has made, the specific words they've used and why that's prompting that response in you. This is a great technique for students who are new to English as well, because they get to come across new words or unfamiliar words without the rest of the text around it as well. OK. The second deep response I want to talk about is this one. And this is a think aloud. So this is the poem that those words came from. It's from The Lost Words, and it's a poem called Bramble. Now, think alouds are a metacognitive process. So it's a way of making my thinking visible. So it shows how I respond personally to a text and how I make sense of it. And it functions as a form of live comprehension. So we have it up and I'm going to talk to you about how I'm making sense of this. And you can ask students to do the same. So you can give them a text and you get them to talk their comprehension out loud or with each other. It can be drawn instead of annotated. If they want to draw the pictures they can see in their mind when they're reading the text, that's a great way of securing comprehension. Or if you want to use software, they can dictate it into the software as well. They can read it out loud into an iPad if the act of writing is going to be something that gets in the way. So here's an example. We start with Bramble is on the march again. And I'm like, who's Bramble? Are they a person? Who's Bramble? Rolling and arching along the hedges into parks on the city edges. I don't know, are they a soldier? I can see it as we're rolling, it's going high in the air. All streets are suddenly thick with briar, cars snarled fast, business over. Moths have come in their millions, drawn to the thorns, the air flutters. I'd spend a lot more time doing this with students, but I'd stop on that stanza. I want to know if this is hurting the moths. This is bothering me at this time, they're on the thorns. It's a problem. And the air is fluttering. And this is confusing because I'm not sure why the air is fluttering and not the moths are fluttering. Why? That's a really interesting word choice. And I'm guessing it's because there's so many moths. It looks like everything's fluttering. That's that's where I'm going with this at the moment. Bramble has reached each house now, looped it in wire. People lock doors, close shutters. They're trapped like an invasion. It's a siege. We're back to the soldiers at the start. Something's happening. It's taking over. And little shoots steal through the keyholes to leave in quiet halls. And I'm thinking shoots like a branch or shoots like a weapon because shoots is a weapony word. But then it leaves empty stairwells and bowls of bright blackberries where the lights fall. And there's a different feeling. It's like an empty house. I'm imagining in my head, like when you go into a house and you see the stairs and on the left, I'm very specific in my head at this point, there's a bowl of blackberries right inside the door. So we've got a lot to unpack here because something's really changed halfway through for me and I'm gonna to want to talk about that. So what I'm modeling here is detailed personal response. And this is the stage I want to get my students to in responding to somebody else's creative voice. And more than anything, I want them to have engaged so far in it that they can tell me what their favorite is. Because when I ask my students, what do they feel? They won't be able to tell me. But when I ask them what their favorite sentence is, they might be. And that's going to be the start of what we do next. Now, I would 
want you to think in your heads. Don't worry about it in the chat at the moment. But if you can find a favorite sentence or you know what your favorite sentence is, have it just in mind for a moment as we go on to the next bit. Oh, by the way, this is what it looks like in the book. It's beautiful. They all come with pictures, but I didn't show the picture at the start because I wanted people to imagine it in their minds for themselves. And what I, another way to do this, if you want to make thinking visible and you don't want to do a full think aloud, but you do want to get students to talk about their thinking and response is to look to Harvard's Project Zero thinking routines. Now, these are a really good way to find a series of steps or structured questions that help students respond personally to texts. And an example would be this, which is connect, extend, challenge. And this could be something that we use after we've done the think aloud or instead of the think aloud, where you ask students to make their thinking visible. So how are the ideas in this poem connected to what you already know? What new ideas did you get from it? And what challenges or puzzles emerged for you? So a challenge or puzzle that emerged for me was I wasn't sure what happened at the end of the poem. I didn't know. And I would want some other people to tell me why we suddenly ended up in a house with bowls on the table. Now, the final part I want us to think about is sentence imitation. Now, the way that students develop their own voice in writing is by being exposed to the voices of other writers and experimenting with taking those voices as their own. Now, Stephen King talks about this in On Writing, where he says that stylistic imitation is a way you get started. It's a very safe way to try on new voices and make mistakes. Um, Paul Butler says it allows students to find their own as they imitate certain aspects of other voices. And you can do this using the text that you've chosen that is your stimulus in the classroom. So for example, I'm taking the sentence here that I liked from that poem, all streets are suddenly thick with briar, Carl snarls fast, business over. That's a sentence that I thought was beautiful. I'm now going to rewrite it, but I'm not going to rewrite it about Bramble. I'm going to rewrite it about Banyan. So I've got a picture of a Banyan tree from our context in Hong Kong. And I want to say to students, if you write this sentence about this image, what could it sound like? So I've given it a go. All walls are suddenly thick with branches, bricks suffocated, held fast. Really similar but about something else. So I've got another one. Bramble has reached each house now, looped it in wire. This is really good for practicing new grammatical structures. So finishing here with an additional clause in the sentence, for example, tying those two together. How could we now, if we were substituting Bramble for Banyan, how could we substitute the different words? How could we think about different verbs? How could we think about different nouns? How could we swap those out within the vocabulary we have available? You can give students words to play with at this point, but get them to practice writing different kinds of sentences is a way to expand their reach as creative writers and try new ways of finding a creative voice. So this one could say something like this, Banyan has reached each street now, gripped it in vines. Swapping out those words to think exactly about what you want it to say. This was the most successful technique I ever used in the classroom. Stand out. My students were writing stories like Raymond Chandler. We were writing short pieces like Hemingway. We would take all these different authors and we would give it a go at just swapping it out. And then eventually, when you've given your students opportunities to write like different people, no matter how old they are, you can start this really young. Eventually, they take the pieces of each author that they want to keep and it becomes part of their own voice that they're establishing for themselves, their original voice, their creative voice that has value. Ironically, this is also something that AI is amazing at. And if you ever want to see something really interesting, you can pop in, I don't know, to write a 
crime drama set in San Francisco in the 1820s in the style of Raymond Chandler, and it will do it for you in a way that's quite entertaining, right? So that's not the end result. This is a process. And by finding the voices of others, students eventually combine them to find a voice of their own, their original voice. And they do it through the gateway of the book that you're passionate about. And finally, we write. So we write focusing on what they want to communicate. And ideally, authentic context. So what is it they want to say to who? Can we find a way for them to do this that feels meaningful? If you want to do something super scary, and it's really interesting to do this, you write live, develop your creative voice with your students. So writing, genuinely writing in front of your students and making the mistakes in front of them is a vulnerable thing to do, but it's super, super powerful. When I was teaching English, I entered a creative writing competition. I did not do well. Right. And I got the feedback afterwards. Part of the deal was you got the feedback from the proper author. And I shared that feedback with my students and showed them how I did when I put my writing into a real context. Um, it's useful for students to see you stumble because creativity is risky. It feels hard. There's a reason why we become less confident at it. So showing students it's still hard for you will make them feel more comfortable about it being hard for them. So if we think finally that creativity is call and response, the reason we are creative is because of what it sparks in others. One idea can catalyze a multitude more in the minds of other people. Ultimately, it's a form of deep communication. It is the thing that binds us. It is the thing that makes us most human. And it is a way that our students will participate in the world as they leave school. So I hope some of these help. Give them a try, the things that I've enjoyed. It's my career as a teacher. Um, Thank you. Hey, so before our session, I'd like to introduce you all the presenters of today so that you know you can pinpoint our hats to our voice. Um, so we have, first of all, our uh, Chief Ex Executive Officer, Ben Whitman with us, and me, myself, Margaret, and also Mariana, the other program directors. We also have three po program managers with us, Zach, secondary program manager, Luke, another secondary program manager, and also Haley as well, the primary program manager. So here's the outline of today. Um, um, I know that we're a little bit over time with that. So I would like to pass the floor to our CEO, Ben Whitman, to begin our session of sharing uh, information about the Chatteris program. Thank you very much, Margaret. I'm sure we'll catch up on time um, as we proceed. So my name is Ben Wheatman, the Chief Executive Officer of the Chatteris Educational Foundation, and I'd like to share with you how we impact students and how we inspire them to become more confident and proficient in using English. So Chatteris is a registered non-profit charitable organisation and we were founded in 1990 and we exist to raise the English proficiency and self-confidence of Hong Kong's young people with a particular focus on those from less privileged backgrounds. When we conduct reviews with our current partner schools, we ask them why they chose Chatteris and these are some of the main reasons. Firstly, within the classroom, schools explain that the average class size at their school is very large. So it's really difficult to maximize student talk time in English. This large class size also means that it's very difficult for teachers to cater to individual students and their specific needs. Furthermore, busy teachers might report that they don't have as much time as they'd like to develop the language activities that students do within the classroom. Outside of the classroom, schools often tell us that students don't really speak much English at all, and they lack the opportunity to use the language in a communicative and purposeful way. They also tell us that students do not really have many opportunities for cultural exchange. I'll now hand to Mariella. 
Thank you, Ben. Our solution to overcome these challenges is the Chatteris English Development Program for Schools, which aims to create an engaging English language environment at your school inside and outside of the classroom. The program involves the placement of a Chatteris native speaking English tutor full time in your school for one academic year from September to May. Our tutors are young and enthusiastic language models for your students. Inside the classroom, they support students and local teachers, and outside the classroom, they run interesting and engaging English language activities. And all of this occurs to enhance student motivation, confidence, creativity, and proficiency in English, as well as provide them with valuable opportunities for cultural exchange. As a charity, we are proud this year to have placed over 53 English tutors across 32 schools, impacting more than 25,000 students. And we have been able to successfully deliver this program for over 30 years due to the high quality of our tutors and our dedicated management support. In this talk, we will provide more information about how the program can impact your school. And I will now hand over to Zach. Thank you, Mariana. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how our program works in practice, and I'm going to start by outlining the qualities of the Chatteris English tutors. Our tutors are proactive, dynamic, and good role models. They're all recent university graduates from various disciplines who come from various countries and can offer insights into various cultural backgrounds. When we recruit tutors, we look for one crucial distinguishing quality, and that is that they're deeply committed and passionate about helping Hong Kong students. Our Chatteris tutors can co-teach with local teachers in the classroom and also deliver small group lessons. This enhances the educator to student ratio in the classroom, allowing for more student English talk time and more opportunity to cater to learner diversity. Furthermore, our partner schools have indicated that another significant benefit of the program is the addition of creative, authentic and communicative ideas and activities to the school curriculum by our tutors. This was most recently observed in our staff's wide range of activities and teaching and learning resources created in preparation for their Christmas themed lessons. Our tutors are also dedicated to assisting students outside of the classroom. Our tutors create a language rich environment by engaging students in a wide range of events and activities during recess, lunch and after school. These informal English experiences cater to student interests, increase motivation to use the language and aid in the development of intercultural competence and soft skills. These activities can range from speaking to students and playing sports and games in English during recess to more structured programs such as English fun fairs and other themed events. Our tutors can also run smaller regular events such as English cafes and clubs such as drama and poetry as well as taking a leading role in English ambassador training, as you can see in some photos here on the slides. It's often easy to overlook the profound educational benefit that non-academic learning activities can have on students, particularly for those who might not usually perform as well in a standard classroom learning environment. We recently asked 190 students to complete a pre and post survey after taking part in an intensive two hour leadership event um, that used English as the medium of instruction. And here we can see a few examples of the outcomes. When we asked students whether they were confident speaking with native English speakers prior to the course, only 21% agreed that they were confident as shown by the blue bar here. After the course, that number jumped to 32.3% of those expressing confidence when speaking with native English speakers. And when we asked students whether they were confident leading a team in English, 8.6 agreed prior to the event and after the event that number rose again to 20.3 percent. If you'd like to book Chatteris to run any similar events at your school then please do get in touch um, using the contact details that are going to be provided at the end of today's session. I will now hand over to Luke. Thank you Zach. I'll just talk a bit about digital resources and learning support that we provide at Chatteris. So the majority of Chatteris English tutors are competent at utilising online English platforms that provide students with enjoyable learning opportunities. Chatteris, uh, Chatteris can also supply tutors with templates, sample resources and further digital training if needed. We offer electronic resources to our partner schools, such as for secondary students, our conversation and discussion courses, and for primary students, interesting learning activities and projects. 
These courses can be taken online and in person using a blended learning approach. The content covers a wide range of topics, including the environment, space, culture, STEM, and so on. Chatteris tutors and partner schools can access the Chatteris Bank of electronic, electronic and physical resources at any time. We will now look at what it means to partner with us at Chatteris. Chatteris is not a tutor recruitment agency, rather we are an active partner committed to making the greatest potential impact on your students. Through partnering with Chatteris, we can provide your school and students with additional manpower for events, as well as leadership, drama and cultural funfairs with ready-made resources that can be easily run by the tutors and school staff. In addition, we host a variety of online professional development webinars for teachers each year. These webinars are created in conjunction with Nord Anglo University. Uh, we invite variety of various educators to share their teaching practices and strategies in each session. Chatters can also conduct a variety of professional development workshops for schools teaching staff in person. These online and in-person professional development uh, sessions are provided at no cost to our partner schools. This year, in order to enhance the English environment in schools, we are providing free English activity resource packs to our partner schools during the first term. Partner schools may request additional resource packs at a low cost. Partnering with Chatteris also means that you will get to work with the only educational charity in Hong Kong that connects international graduates, local schools and community partners to best impact your students. We have connections with a wide range of organizations in Hong Kong that want to collaborate with us to provide unique experiential learning opportunities for students. Our program of inspirational events is well established and includes internships, guest talks at school assemblies and office visits for students. We have a strong relationship with companies that are similarly de dedicated to helping students, such as Morgan Stanley, LinkedIn and Outward Bound, amongst others. I'll now pass the floor back to Mariana. Thanks, Luke. The quality of our English tutors and our strict quality assurance processes are the reasons why our current primary and secondary partner schools have worked with us on average for seven years. Our management team will collaborate with you to ensure that the program we deliver is tailored to your needs and offers the greatest possible impact on your students. This includes setup and program design meetings at the beginning of the year, interim and end of year review meetings, and regular communication throughout the school year. Our program manager assigned to your school will also visit at least once a month to observe your tutor and provide feedback to ensure that your expectations and goals are being met. When it comes to our English tutors, we maintain their high quality through a rigorous recruitment process. We take care of all administrative requirements, including police, medical and qualification checks, as well as visa sponsorship. And then all of our tutors attend a three week intensive orientation prior to placement in your school to make sure they're well equipped to work alongside Hong Kong students. As well as this, all tutors receive ongoing professional development and support throughout the year, including monthly workshops and on-site training. Our service to partner schools is made possible by a well-qualified and committed executive management team with experience both internationally and in Hong Kong, coming from backgrounds in education, educational technology, and teaching English as a foreign language as well as a dedicated team of full-time program managers who support your English tutor and school throughout the year. One program manager never supports more than nine schools, so they're always available to assist you. We also have a member of staff with expertise in resource development and design, and a member of staff with experience in fundraising and development, which allows us to operate a variety of free services for less privileged students and schools, as well as a well-experienced back office team. 
And Chatteris is supported and guided by an incredibly experienced board of trustees with backgrounds in education, finance, and HR. One of our trust trustees, Professor Amy Choi, is Professor Emerita in the Division of English Language Education and former chair professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong. I will now hand over to Haley. So partnering with us supports our commitment to fulfilling the vision of empowering Hong Kong students with enhanced English proficiency and intercultural understanding, enabling them to succeed in an increasingly globalised world. In the 2022 to 23 academic year, 100% of our partner schools said that our programme positively impacted their students' motivation and interest in English and helped students' confidence in speaking English. 75% of students in focus groups demonstrated improvement in their communicative English skills. I'd like to provide a further case study that demonstrates our commitment to increasing the English proficiency of all students in Hong Kong. In 2015, we started the One for One Adopt School project, which specifically targets and supports schools with a high proportion of less privileged students. Under the project, the school funds a single Chatteris English tutor, and then we undertake funding and promotion for the school to match it with a generous sponsor who funds a second full-time Chatteris tutor in the same school, completely free of charge. With the partnership of two tutors, students' language and cultural exposure is substantially increased. As well as this, students at our one-for-one -one schools gain access to numerous other social, cultural and professional opportunities supported by their sponsor. This year, we have five one-for-one -one schools and we have been lucky enough to impact over 4,000 student beneficiaries so far. We are happy to report that we have received donations to allow Chatteris to offer three additional schools with funding and free English tutors in the 2024 to 25 academic year. If your school has a high proportion of disadvantaged students, such as students on textbook allowance, SEN students or newly arrived students from mainland China, we will be really interested in speaking with you to see if you could be a potential one-for-one -one partner. If you have any further questions or are interested in the one-for-one -one project, you may contact us using the details shared at today's sharing. Due to the success of our drama leadership and school fund fair programmes based on student and school feedback, some of which Zach shared earlier, we are offering non-partner schools the opportunity to book these learning experiences this coming June, July and August 2024. The drama and leadership activities are around two to three hours in length for around 60 students or less at a time. And the fun fairs typically are themed around subjects such as different cultures or protecting the environment and they are suitable for a while around 100 students at any one time. Also this summer, we will resume offering schools cultural and heritage outings. These aim to foster students' deeper understanding and appreciation of Hong Kong's history. If your school is interested in applying to join our Summer Level Up Learning Programme, please contact Chatteris using the details provided at the end of this session. These opportunities can serve as fun post-exam activities or as bridging programmes for your incoming students. Additionally, thanks to generous donors, we have the opportunity to deliver this programme for free in schools that, have, that serve a high proportion of students from less privileged backgrounds. We will provide you with details on how to apply for this after you contact us. So uh, I'm very happy to share with you about our cooperation with Chatteris in the past six years. As many of our students uh, lack exposure to English and indeed the opportunity to use English in their daily lives, getting our students to interact more with native speakers has made a significant impression on their educational, educational journey, not simply in the classroom, but also outside of it. That's why we want to, we hope to have uh, more native speakers in our school. And then we try to um, we try to uh, implement our school program and incorporate a lot of uh, elements in our uh, curriculum. So the uh, native speaker, the CNET, uh, mainly help us with all 
all round uh, um, circumstances, like they will help us in, in both curriculum and activities. They also teach with us organize activities for our students at school. Tetris has um has the longest uh, history working with CBLMC compared with other uh, elder service provider. Um, uh, just like Ben mentioned, Chatteris uh, can potentially offer us uh, two CNETs as part of one for one program, giving our students more exposure to native speakers. And right now we have three uh, net teachers at school and they have nurtured our students and provide a more immersive environment for students to use English and feel comfortable to incorporate in our in their daily lives. So we welcome and treasure the cooperation with CNS at CBLMC. They help in both cur the curriculum and activities. So like here in the curriculum, uh, in our English curriculum, they co-teach using our school-based PLPR program and GE program. We have co-planning and we have, uh, actually we have co-planning every two weeks and they they, there will be a strong collaboration and communication among teachers. So we hope that uh, it will help to uh, to develop our students more uh, more proficient in English, and also it also help to uh, create a um, collaborative collaborative working environment as well. Rofa, they also prepare a lot of um, great resources interactive act, uh, classroom activities in class. They help with uh, some audio, uh, like providing some audio script uh, for our list for students listening exam and dictation revision. Of course, learning has not uh, just been, has, has far beyond the classroom. Students are given uh, unique opportunities to participate in different uh, activities. So they are like integrated language activities, fun land, after school classes, leading leadership program, excursion, competitions, and some special school events. Oh, so here are some of our um, level activities. Uh, we are very happy to have extra manpower from Chatteris. They will come and help us uh, to be our some of uh, some. Some are our leaders, some are our judges in the in the activities, and we are happy that students enjoy and they are they are really excited and willing to chat with them. Um, CNES also have to train uh, English ambassadors, um, and ambassadors will help to uh, run some game game booths in at English Funland. So in our English fun life, we have quite a lot of activities like board games, uh, speaking activities, art and crafts as well. So here are some, some of the highlights. Also design a lot of games, like art and crafts activities. You know, uh, we, we know that English is not just a language, but also a way to present and communicate with others. So by seeing the students, how engaged they are in these arts and crafts activities, their language skills and artistic skills is gradually enhanced. And CNET helps to nurture students' creativity and visual literacy in this aspect. There are also karaoke and movie day at Funland. And nothing is better than having cultural uh, exchange activities at school, where learning takes place across uh, different uh, disciplines. Like we have Chinese New Year uh, festivals, and we design, uh, we have a lot of game booths there with Christmas uh, celebration and uh, diff for different uh, festivals. So here, there are some, uh, um, there are, the students are playing and learning English, at the, about the Chinese New Year at the fun fair. And CNES also dress up <laughs> at Christmas and then try to uh, 
create a um, um, friendly and joy joyful atmos atmosphere for Christmas, and students um students are happy and and great to see the new out outlook of the CNETs. This year, we also have intercultural club, and we find that students enjoy uh, the CNETs from different countries, and they learn about their cultures. In the previ in previous years, uh, we also all, um, joined some activities organized by chapters, like um, the excursion uh, to uh, Lemur Island. Uh, it's also about our environmental protection, which is uh, related to our school curriculum. Uh, for P6 students, they are having a topic about environmental uh, protection. So we find that this is also uh, a, very, a very fruitful experience for students. Competition is always exciting and rewarding to kids. Thanks Chatteris and CNETs for organizing different competitions, both into school or uh, um, or uh, in, in different ways and let students use English to give presentations. Uh, students really enjoy it and I think they grow, um, they grow a lot in uh, different competitions. So these are some of their uh, after school activities, uh, trying to um, do a lot of treasure hunt and then some arts and crafts activities. Petrus has proven to provide good support for CNETs throughout the academic year. And the impacts of the program has not simply extended to students, but, sorry, but also to the point uh, that have been formed between local, in, local teachers and the Chatteris native speakers who work so closely together. The cross-cultural exchange that has formed within this partnership will leave a lasting impact on the ways um, to interact how local teachers conduct their co-teaching practices. Once again, um, we, we are very happy to have seen us to work with us in our English department and make it a colorful and shining team. Yeah, Candy, I was wondering maybe if you could just talk a little bit about um, the difference of the one for one program in regards to um, how you deploy that second tutor as opposed to if you only had one. Mm -hmm. uh, we are really happy to have like uh, two CNETs at school. And because now uh, in our school, we have three net teachers. So we are very happy to uh, make sure every level of students can have exposure to native English speakers. So uh, each net teacher, they are going. They are responsible to teach two levels. So, like for our uh, for our official uh, CNET, uh, for official net teacher, uh, he's teaching P one and P six this year, and then for uh, another two uh, CNETs, they both teach two levels, and they also have. Uh, we this year we try to arrange some peer observation for them as well so that they can learn from each other and then they can communicate and exchange more on teaching um, uh, teaching aspects. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe just your own personal opinion. Uh, from what you've observed, what's been one of the more popular activities that the tutors have run so far this year for the students? Oh, this year we find it really happy to have like two uh two tutors from different countries for different nationalities. So in the intercultural club, students are really excited to learn different cultures. They they know that oh we learn English, but actually English is a world language, and students can experience and try to pick up some uh, accent from different nationality, like from Scottish accent, uh, which is different from what we used to to talk to them. So I find that uh, students are very happy and they they like to enjoy and experience and enjoy different cultures from uh, native speakers. Yes, I remember that when I was a tutor as well, slang 
too. It's quite yeah. often very interesting to students. Finally, kind of why Chatteris? Well, we're a registered non-profit charitable organization, meaning that surplus income, if any, doesn't go towards um, any kind of fat cats at Chatteris or any kind of private owners. Um, it purely goes towards the development of our program further to support schools and students. Our English tutors are incredibly motivated and they're matched to best impact your students inside and outside of the classroom. We have an incredibly strong quality assurance component to our program and that's supported by a team of very experienced management staff who can also offer additional manpower for services to your school. We're also well placed to help schools and students in areas of things like digital and physical resource creation and also staff professional development. We also take responsibility for the administrative requirements of hiring and onboarding quality English tutors. These are often challenging um, for a school to deal with. And finally, we have a program where we can provide additional free funded English tutors to your school with three confirmed new slots for next year, as well as summer activities as well, if your school caters to a high proportion of less privileged schools. Uh, students. And then we also have some testimonials here from our current local school partners or past current or past as well. Um, but we will send you this PowerPoint and you can certainly read that uh, in your own time. In regards to next steps, here's the timeline for applying to the Chatteris Partnership. So if your school is interested, the first step is to set up a consultation meeting with Chatteris any time from now until the end of March. We do not work with just any school. We want to make sure that your school aligns with the Chatteris approach in regards to activities both inside and outside of the classroom, for example. Our executive team members will then come to meet with you at your school and we'll get to know you a little bit more about your needs and we'll discuss how we could work together to make the greatest possible impact on your students. If both parties feel that the program will be valuable to implement within the school, um, then we will ask you to submit an application uh, with further information and details for the year ahead. Um, applications to our program are open until the end of April. So ideally we should, um, and this should occur before your school begins any tendering process. So sometimes we will have great schools that apply to us um, and they'll just give us a tender straight away. We don't just react to tenders. We always want to get to know your school before we take part in any tender process. So please do take the time to ask us to come and visit before sending in a tender. We're, of course, happy to undertake any tender requirements. If your school has any different tender timelines, then just let us know and we can work to those. Um, if your school has no tender process, then we can confirm the deployment of our tutors uh, really from March onwards. But usually if tenders are involved, it might be later in May. And that is everything that we wanted to share with you so far. So now's the time if you have any questions um, for us to um, hopefully answer them.